Welcome everyone, it's the top of the hour, so we'll get started. I'm Theo Wagesbeck in Houston, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's GlomCon seminar. Today, we're excited to have Dr. Anjali Sadaskar, Professor and Director of Renal and Transplant Pathology in the Department of Pathology at The Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, speak with us on PGN-MID or C3-GN, a case discussion. Dr. Sadaskar, thank you for joining us. Sure, I will. So can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Great. So uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thanks, Dia, for the kind introduction. Also, thanks to the GlomCon team for this initiative and organizing these lectures every weekend. They are really informative, and the topics are really timely. So with that, I'll start. Uh, I want to focus today on uh, PGNMID and C3G, particularly the diagnostic overlaps and the dilemmas that come up. Uh, and I want to make it a case-based uh, discussion. Uh, I know uh, about just two weeks ago, we had this wonderful, wonderful lecture from Dr. Sethi, who gave an extensive overview of uh, MPGN and many of these uh, disease entities. And for a minute at that time, I thought, is there really anything left to be discussed? It was such a, a wonderful overview. But I think this is a complex uh, group of diseases. Uh, every patient appears to have a unique trajectory and requires a lot of tailoring of therapy. So I think it's worth uh, more uh, discussion. And... Uh, uh, what I want to show today is uh, the journey of one particular patient we had here, an unfortunate case, but a very interesting case. We actually published it uh, under the title MPGN with Changing Immunofluorescence Patterns. However, it is a wor work in progress. These diseases tend to be relentless. The patient is still undergoing uh, therapy, uh, so it's not cured by any chance. So uh, the way this case unfolded, the teaching pearls that gleaned from this case uh, that I learned, both from diagnostic and therapeutic point of view, that's what I want to discuss today. And then uh, uh, Dr. Rovin, uh, uh, Director of uh, Nephrology here at OSU, will talk about uh, newer uh, anti-plasma cell, anti-B cell, and complement-based therapies in the context of this patient. I think it's, it's very important, these new drugs that are coming on the horizon, they will probably prove to be very important, uh, particularly in this personalized medicine era, in these uh, relentless uh, diseases, these MPGN-type diseases. So uh, let's start. Uh, our case was a 17-year-old uh, Caucasian female who was uh, otherwise quite active. Actually, she was active in sports. Uh, she noticed this lower extremity edema during her travels, which, I, in my opinion, is pretty nonspecific. Many of us uh, develop uh, lower extremity edema during prolonged uh, uh, travel. But that was in early 2007. However, it, it didn't go away. She had this on and off swelling, which gradually progressed to mild shortness of breath. And she presented to our institution in late 2007. She had been having repeated labs around that period, and they did notice a rise in her serum uh, creatinine, uh, rise in her urine protein. It was almost in the nephrotic range in her, on her 24-hour collection. She had low complements. C3 was extremely low. C4 was also low. And at that point, uh, she underwent her first kidney biopsy here. It uh, definitely showed a membranoproliferative pattern of glomerular injury with enlargement of the glomeruli, mesangial as well as endocapillary uh, hypercellularity, and this nodular lobular accentuation of the glomeruli. There were no crescents, no necrotizing lesions, no interstitial inflammation to speak of, and uh, no interstitial fibrosis, tubular atrophy either. So mainly it was glomerular involvement, diffuse, all the glomeruli looked like this. Uh, on, this is a silver stain. I'm purposely showing this stain because it uh, nicely highlights uh, the GBM thickening. In fact, you may even see a few spikes, which are actually uh, associated with membranous. But uh, the, I mean, that, that's how this disease progresses. As Dr. Sethi nicely described, there are repeated episodes of injury and healing, cycles of injury, healing, and injury. That's how the GBM gets thickened and shows this duplication and remodeling, which we will see better on electron microscopy. On immunofluorescence, there was clearly IgG staining along the capillary loops and mesangium. IgA, IgM, although not totally negative, they were just showed a touch of staining, very segmental, granular staining. Uh, C1Q was similar, very mild. But C3 was absolutely shouting out loud. It's like 3 plus diffuse mesangial and capillary walls. So mainly IgG and C3. Kappa and lambda showed uh, uh, lambda predominance. Kappa, again, was not totally negative. There was some segmental staining, which is not surprising because there are other heavy chains also, IgA, IgM. So the kappa could be associated with that. But predominantly, it was IgG, C3, and lambda. Uh, on electron microscopy, there were large subendothelial uh, deposits. There were a few small intramembranous deposits, but I did not really see big subepithelial humps or anything. They were mainly subendothelial without any substructure. 
uh, more of those deposits. Also, there was a lot of porosite food process effacement. There was already some GBM duplication. As you can see, this is the original uh, glomerular basement membrane. And then there's a new GBM uh, forming, almost like tram tracking. And there were electron de dense deposits in trapped.